we just kind of introduce kind of who you are and then kind of what you your role is on the ML.net team. Bree, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Uh, so I am Bree. I work on the ML.net team, uh, specifically in the .NET side of things um, as a PM. Um, yeah, so that includes uh, a bit of the framework and a lot of the tooling. Um, yeah, so you've probably seen my face around for ML.NET things mm. recently. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let's see, Eric. So I'm um, Eric Earhart. I'm a developer on on the .NET team proper, but I was kind of on loan to the ML.NET team to help with making a a great API, trying to make it as as .NET y as as possible, I guess. And so that's how I kind of got involved in the project, um, being the the representative from the .NET libraries team. Okay, and you've done stuff with the data frame API as well, right? Yep. Yeah. There's um, <laughs> to get a little bit into the, some of the history is, um, two two and a half years ago, the .NET team kind of decided that there wasn't that great of machine learning capabilities and data processing, um, in .NET, and we kind of thought that. <laughs> We thought that we we need it and that our customers need it, and so, um, so kind of my larger role has kind of been the what can we do in .NET to make more things, more, more data scientist type of operations in .NET, and so um, helping helping drive ML.NET to um, open source, but then also even things like the data frame. And then trying to get the notebook experience, mm -hmm. um, some of the .NET interactive, I've been involved in, in a lot of that as well. So, and then even not specifically machine learning, but like um, .NET for Apache Spark, we we open sourced yeah. that like last year, I think. And I've been involved in some of that projects as well. Um, and it's just yeah, there's just been all sorts of different random projects. So like that led me to to working on the Apache Arrow, um, C Sharp library. To, oh, okay. to be able to exchange data and well. So yeah, it's kind of that's kind of my niche in the in the .NET team is is the data mm -hmm. and machine learning um, area. Oh, interesting. I didn't know there was an Apache Arrow uh, .NET framework around out there now. Yeah, it supports reading and writing batches. I one of my if I ever get time in my, <laughs> in my you're not in my day job is I want to support uh, start supporting um, the Arrow Flight. If anybody's ever seen mm -hmm. the Arrow Flight, it's like gRPC endpoints for streaming mm -hmm. Arrow data. We don't have that support in .NET yet in in Apache Arrow. So if anybody's looking for something to do, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to start working on that. I'd love to help somebody guide somebody through that. Yeah, sounds interesting. Uh, Harish, you want to go next? Uh, I think I'm a more recent entry to ML.NET. I've been on the team for about a year now. Uh, uh, I'm the engineering manager for uh, the ML.NET team now. Uh, in the past, uh, I've had lots of uh, other uh, roles at Microsoft. Uh, uh, for a long time, I was in Windows and Windows Embedded, uh, Windows CE, back in the distant past, if you remember. Um, uh, but more recently, in the for the last five years or so, I'd been in uh, Microsoft Research. I was working on uh, building technologies for people with disabilities. Uh, I was uh, leading a team to build uh, technologies for people with ALS. And as a result, we shipped uh, eye tracking and eye control into Windows. Hmm. Uh, that is my most recent work. And after that, I moved about a year back into ML.NET. And it's, it's been great so far, it's a lot to learn, and uh, looking forward to where we can take ML.NET. Yeah, uh, Natalie. Uh, yeah, hi there. Um, I've actually had two roles with ML.NET. I used to be the um, the docs lead in the content and learning um, org, and I'm now the um, the PM for the ML.NET um, core API in the AI frameworks team. Um, and I come from a uh, developer experience background, so um, that's definitely where my interests lie. Um, I'm always trying to make things easier and better and um, just more fun for developers. So it's great that you're doing this. Um, and yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, the dogs have been great. I used them a lot. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I can't take full credit. I had a, I had a team, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Jake. This was the next. So I've also had two roles, kind of. I um, started out, I think, two years ago as the first developer on the on the tooling side, so trying to figure out how we were going to um, offer tools inside of Visual Studio or, or wherever we needed to. Um, and then as we sort of started to figure that out and grew the team, I, I, I switched more over to to the manager role. Um, so now I'm, I'm leading an awesome team to, to develop the tools, both Model Builder and uh, CLI. Cool. Great tools, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Well, uh, thank everybody for, for joining, uh, spending your time. I really appreciate it. Um, so that's kind of, I guess we can kind of go back here and uh, go over a little bit of the history of ML.net, how it got started and, and all that. Okay. So that, I can take one, take that one. Um, so internally at Microsoft, like there's a lot of teams internally that use .NET. So it, and then some of those teams also needed to do machine learning for roughly the past decade. And so there was a project that had a few names, few names during its life, but in the end it was kind of called TLC or the learning code. It's what TLC stood for that kind of grew up as more or less an internal open source project that a bunch of different teams inside of Microsoft not only used but also contributed to. So there would be, you know, some teams for, or some people from Bing working on it, or even they would take, you know, contributions from um, other teams throughout Microsoft. And this kind of grew up as an, you know, an internal product that a lot of teams used, but it was never, you know, publicly made available just for, it was never pro, you know, made as a, produ a product that we would offer people. And as a lot of people know, you know, five-ish years ago, .NET really moved to embracing open source software. And so with the whole move to .NET Core, um, the, the .NET team is really behind open source, open source software. Like if, you, if you're making libraries, we, yeah, we just love the model, right? And um, two and a half-ish, two, two and a half-ish years ago, the the .NET team kind of took a look around and decided that there there wasn't there wasn't a, a go to library or tooling for doing data and machine learning <clears throat> in .NET, and we kind of canvassed everywhere and met up with the the TLC team that there was a central team that actually owned it at that time, and we collaborated between the .NET team, which was in the DevDiv org. And, and the TLC team, which is in kind of the AI um, org, to bring bring the project open source um, and available for, for everybody to use, I guess. And so it, it, as part of doing that, there of course was, you know, internal tools and internal API that, that probably wasn't great for public consumption, if that makes any sense. So like, for example, there was a command line tool internally where you could provide it, basically your your request of your whole data pipeline in this new language, if you will, that, so the command line was just, you know, lines upon lines long. Mm. And um, people used it and people were very, very, successful with it but trying to document it and support it long term we just felt like oh let's let's not do it that way instead that's how like the mlnet um auto 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 ml tool kind of grew up out of out of some of that learning from the from the command line tool similarly the api in net we didn't really feel was was a public it was never designed to be a public api it was always you know, internal into Microsoft, whatever needs to be done, we're just making the API. So the .NET team and the TLC team spent a lot of time refactoring and changing the API. And what kind of grew out of that, it kind of made a schism a little bit of, there's the TLC product and then the ML.NET product. And so the old APIs, when you're coming from TLC, you kind of had to migrate to these new APIs. 
and some of the tools you used to use in TLC weren't available anymore. Um, but now, I don't know, Harish can maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but pretty much ML.NET's the only thing that's actually being actively developed. There's still internal sources that um, we've n we never open sourced that are built on top of ML.NET now, but... Yeah. That, uh, sorry. That's correct. Uh, TLC uh, is has a very rich heritage, like uh, Eric was saying. Uh, it's been developed for over a decade, uh, and ML.NET grew out of that. Uh, so, uh, but right now, ML.NET is the uh, only active thing being developed. TLC still has a lot of usage, and when we think of uh, ML.NET usage uh, internally, we do have to think of TLC and ML.NET together because they are essentially, they, they share a lot of code together. The, the API is, is different, and so things are not compatible, but the core algorithms and the core implementation are quite identical. Uh, so we have very widespread deployments of uh, TLC and ML.NET internally as well. Uh, but like Eric was saying, uh, ML.NET is our current and future focus for .NET developers. Cool. Yeah, it seems like it has a lot of rich history there. All right, so uh, let's kind of jump a little bit, and if anybody wants to explain uh, why would develop why would developers want to use ML.NET, uh, kind of as opposed to something in Python like Scikit-Learn uh, for their machine learning pipelines. Um. I think Eric can take this one. I can take this one as well, or so can others. Uh, like when I came in, uh, for me, the uh, like I love Python as well, and uh, it's a really nice language. But the first big difference I noticed uh, when I started learning ML.NET was uh, essentially IDataView. view, uh, and the advantages uh, you get with uh, IDataView view and how all of ML.NET is structured around that. Uh, we get really scalable data processing. Um, and it's really a credit to the uh, original designers for uh, bringing essentially the core concepts of a database and the streaming data processing into a nice small compact library that allows you to do uh, data processing for machine learning. Uh, I think uh, uh, this has been a key uh, advantage for, uh, uh, for ML.NET. Uh, we are able to process large amounts of data in in a fraction of the memory that would uh, be required on Python and uh, other languages. Uh, similar things are being developed in uh, Python right now, uh, but I think ML.NET has a really clear uh, advantage there. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, C Sharp has a very rich ecosystem, and this is the go-to library for anybody wishing to do uh, classical machine learning on uh, and data processing on uh, .NET frameworks. Um, the, um, let's see. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, just follow, I'll just follow up on that. I mean, I think you've identified the two things. So basically, if you are coming from a .NET ecosystem, um, like that's what we hear, you know, from our developers, that they come from a .NET ecosystem and they want to remain in the .NET ecosystem and ML.NET offers them that opportunity for machine learning. And then, of course, the speed. Um, I can, so... Yeah, and uh, C Sharp overall has had uh, better integration into production pipelines uh, historically. Uh, Microsoft has a lot of its customers in the enterprise space, uh, and the language and the tooling uh, has all been uh, directed towards uh, production environments. Whereas Python, uh, I think, has grown out of a more research environment, uh, and all the uh, uh, machine learning and the data processing libraries around Python have been uh, more directed with a research mindset. So on one hand, you see really cool uh, development happening on Python, but on the other hand, for production environments, uh, C Sharp is really well suited, both in terms of performance and the tooling. Yeah, and kind of going to that performance, I think there was a, uh, a paper uh, about ML.NET that kind of shows comparisons with with that, with you know, Scikit-Learn, and it, I think ML.NET was more performant than Scikit-Learn and very large data. I don't remember the 
the paper details offhand, but yes, uh, we consistently see it uh, even now. Uh, ML.NET uh, and especially with the auto ML.NET as well, uh, data processing is uh, possible on large amounts of data on much smaller machines and with much uh, lesser memory. Yeah, that's always a good thing to have that extra performance boost. <laughs> yeah, and the uh, a, a related um, advantage, which I don't know uh, if has been explored enough, uh, is that this makes ML.NET also much suited on, uh, better suited on the edge. That if you want to do some uh, machine learning on the edge, where you don't have the same compute and uh, memory capabilities of a massive server and a data center, uh, this is a really nice uh, tool to have. And by edge, you mean like IoT devices? Yeah. Okay. Uh, like you can throw an Intel NUC, uh, and uh, you can do lots of things on an Intel NUC. All right. So that's great, great benefits on um, uh, using ML.NET. Uh, for y'all, what do y'all think would be the, the future of ML.NET, uh, such as do you think there'll be more like deep learning features coming soon? Or uh, I think I've seen some people wanting some object detection in there. So um, uh, the future is a great question, uh, and it's a hard question. Uh, we are uh, in the planning phase right now. We are continuously discussing uh, uh, how do we weigh against how do we bring our uh, customer requirements with what's possible right now and what we are uh, capable <clears throat> of delivering uh, within a reasonable time frame? Um, so uh, I think our immediate focus right now has been uh, time series uh, because of some internal requirements. And you will see like in 1.5 and uh, current releases, uh, a lot of work coming on time series uh, uh, like anomaly detection and root cause analysis. Uh, but going forward, um, uh, we've had a lot of discussions with uh, Jake and Bree about uh, object detection and also trying to shift more towards AutoML.NET uh, mm -hmm. to provide more capabilities out of the box uh, to developers. Um, I, I think of this as the, the classic wizard model that uh, Visual Studio and DevDev has had a lot of success with. Uh, how do you lower the uh, barrier to entry for developers for uh, new technologies. Um, and this this goes back to um, um, I don't know, class wizard and MFC doing project wizards. Uh, Visual Studio has been very, very good on those things. So we are working with Jake and Bree uh, constantly on that for improving. And I think they can talk about it more uh, about the tooling around that. And that's also going to be one of our focuses. Uh, Jake, do you want to? Yeah, I can touch on it too. It, there's sort of an interesting thing too, where we have our we have our tooling, um, and that can kind of go at a different pace than ML.NET. Although we're trying to make it a cohesive experience across all of it. So, for you brought up object detection, um, that happens to be a scenario that we're working on right now. Um, and at Microsoft, we already offer object detection training in Azure. And so we're going to light it up from a tooling perspective where you can go and you know take your data, use the same experience that you have in Model Builder that you would use to train locally, but instead train in Azure. And from Azure, you get a um, an Onyx model that you can then use in your um, your .NET applications and do, doing inference. Um, so we're 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 kind of still we're we're pushing this from from the tooling perspective to make sure that you can you know bring these problems and and use the available technologies that that Microsoft has to train the models and then be able to consume it in your .NET applications. At the same time, <clears throat> we're we're also relying a lot on the community. So we like the the field is rapidly changing. We're not sure which you know which of the many different deep learning frameworks are actually going to be the winner. Um, instead, we're trying to be really supportive of uh, community efforts like SciSharp, where they're empowering you know developers to to leverage existing frameworks in the .NET .NET world. Um, Part of our, our goal is to is to take those those frameworks, which if you just put .NET bindings sort of on top of them, it's still kind of difficult to use. It's not developer friendly, um, and so we, although we don't know you know what the ultimate like winner is going to be from that framework perspective, um, you know it could be something new that that isn't out right now. Um, we want to create sort of a a layer on top of that, which. Um, makes it sort of scenario 
uh, driven. So like object detection, natural language processing, et cetera. Um, but then we can kind of adapt how it's implemented uh, underneath. So we, we, we want to empower um, all of our users to, to, use, to start solving all of these different types of problems. Um, so one thing that the community can definitely do to, to help us drive our priorities is like bring problems to us, tell us what scenarios you, uh, you want solved, like give us real world examples and we'll try and you know, either solve it with our, our tooling, like how we're doing with object detection and Azure training, um, or we'll try and get it in our AutoML, sort of our developer friendly API, or we can try and push it into our, our frameworks. But we kind of need, um, that's why we you know, love doing these sorts of things. It's like the more community involvement we get to help us drive our direction, that will um, that'll tell us where we're going to invest and, and how much effort to put into it. Yeah, I want to add a small bit to that, which is you can really think of this stack as uh, three layers. There is ML.NET uh, at the bottom, then there is, uh, which has its own API, and AutoML.NET, uh, mm -hmm. which provides a different level of API. And then there is Model Builder and the Associated Tooling. So uh, depending on the user scenarios, we can choose to address these at different levels. Uh, if we are missing some core algorithms, and uh, then we would uh, go back and look at it at uh, the AutoML.NET, uh, uh, sorry, at the ML.NET layer. Uh, but if it is, Hey, ML.NET is has its capabilities, but it would be great if uh, we could do it a little bit more automated. That figuring out these hyperparameters is a problem, and uh, we want to lower the uh, barrier to entry there. There, but you're still okay with code. Then we can do it at the AutoML.NET layer. Uh, but if you just want a one-click solution, then Model Builder is the way to go. So depending on what maybe three clicks, was, but <laughs> sorry. I said maybe three clicks, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have a pattern for one click, so. <laughs> um, so depending on the community's needs, uh, we will figure out what's the best way to uh, address these. Yeah, and Jake, you mentioned uh, having the commun community kind of ask for feature requests. Uh, is the best way to do that on the MO.NET? Uh, repository just to create an issue? Yeah, probably. I, I think yeah. there's a couple different repos. I mean, if you if there's something that you specifically want solved in like the tooling, um, we have the model builder repo, but we all work closely together. So if it ends up in any of the machine learning repos, we'll we'll communicate and make sure it gets to the right team. Yeah, if, if you notice, issues keep getting transferred between us, between the repos. So the uh, our uh, users uh, are welcome to open their uh, their issue in either of the repos, and we will figure out where it fits and we will transfer it accordingly. Okay, cool. And uh, so I know we mentioned some on Python. Uh, some people might want to still use Python, but still use kind of the the speed enhancements of ML.NET. Uh, is there any way you can use ML.NET in Python right now? Uh, absolutely. So uh, we do have Nimbus, which uh, uh, is an experimental project. I think it's a good place for some for developers to evaluate whether this is a uh, this the solution fits them. Uh, what we have is uh, Nimbus is built on top of ML.NET uh, and there's a set of Python wrappers around ML.NET. So you get the same benefits of uh, IDataView view and streaming data processing that you would get from ML.NET, but you also get the uh, Python ecosystem uh, that you might be comfortable with. So you could say do a bunch of uh, pre-processing on uh, on your data on your Python uh, environment, and then feed it to ML.NET for uh, uh, for processing them in a streaming fashion. So Nimbus, uh, I would say, is still an experimental project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would love to hear from our users uh, if somebody has played with Nimbus, uh, what they think of it, and uh, how it makes their needs. Cool. I play with it a little bit, and it's been a good experience so far. So, and kind of a little bit on some details on how that works. Uh, that uses something that ML.NET has called entry points, right? Right. Um, I can cover it briefly. Eric, do you want to take that one? Uh, on entry points? Yeah, I can. Um, the entry points were, at first they were they were going to be the API. Well, at one point it was it was kind of thought that this would be the API is anytime you wanted to talk to ML.NET, you would use these these entry points, 
which are basically like even higher level API wrappers around around ml.net the API and there was a decision made pretty early on when we when we open sourced that well if you're in .net and you want to talk into ml.net why would you want to go through these other entry point APIs when you should be able to just directly reference the libraries itself and just deal with the libraries and so <clears throat> um a, a lot of the work was was when we made that API moving all the the .NET APIs down lower to, to underneath the entry points, and then when we looked at it, we were like, well, this doesn't need to be public right now. So we so we made all the entry point APIs internal until we decided if we need to be public or not. But one of the the internal consumers of it is is Nimbus ML, and so kind of the way the entry points works is Nimbus ML builds up a, a JSON graph of this is what the the pipeline or this is what my data workload wants to uh, what I want to do with this data. I want to do these transformations and then do this learning and then maybe do this post learning thing. OK, now go ML.net. Here's all my whole <clears throat> my whole pipeline all in a JSON graph. And so then entry points takes that JSON graphs and then starts building up the pipeline. Um, based you know, basically weekly typed or dynamically using the ml.net API that we expose to normal.net developers. And so that that's a way that other languages, specifically Python, but the idea was we could have made other languages be able to talk to ml.net as well through this general, basically JSON graph of this is how the pipeline I want to I want to run the data pipeline I want to run. OK. Cool. So kind of keeping along with the, the Python aspect. Uh, so say we have the scenario, we have some data scientists who do all the work in Python. Uh, they, they build a model and all that, and they want to productionize it. But we, like me as a .NET developer, how can I use that model that they given me within a, a .NET application as in with ML.NET? So uh, one uh, possible solution for that is, uh, um, I mean, it, to some extent, it would depend on uh, what framework they're using. Uh, I think uh, if it's PyTorch, uh, there is a, an export mechanism to convert a given PyTorch model to Onyx. And Onyx is sort of the bridge uh, between uh, uh, multiple frameworks and multiple languages as the, let's say, the lingua franca for model pers persistence. Um, and that's what Microsoft is putting a lot of its effort uh, around. So you can take a PyTorch model, uh, export it to Onyx, and then run your inferencing uh, using ML.NET in a C# -sharp environment uh, using uh, Onyx Transformer. Uh, it gives you uh, the ability. To, it gives data scientists the ability to uh, train and experiment and build their models in Python, and then have the same model be uh, executed in the production environment uh, seamlessly. Yeah, and, and you can also do that for TensorFlow models and scikit-learn models and, and te, you know, models developed with TensorFlow with the Keras API as well. Um, there's um, Onyx converters for all of those frameworks, um, and then they can be imported into ML.NET. Yes. So I guess I have a follow-up question. We also do have some um, ways of, like, importing TensorFlow models into. I don't know what the limitations are. Um, is there... I guess, is there a recommendation from us to specifically go to Onyx or do some of those other APIs work? No, we can execute TensorFlow, like we do have a TensorFlow uh, transformer and we can execute TensorFlow models as well. Um, and I would say, I, I think that the machine learning community is, or the AI, uh, at least the deep learning community is uh, sort of uh, congealing around either TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, and, uh, um, uh, the, but in terms of model exchange, uh, I think Onyx is solidifying itself as uh, the uh, the framework and language for model exchange. So regardless of uh, what framework you develop in, you can always convert them into uh, Onyx. And recently Onyx has shown uh, remarkable performance improvements in execution uh, compared to both uh, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch. So uh, you can have an Onyx backend and execute 
your models uh, much better uh, with Onyx. Uh, and um, I think Microsoft is uh, very heavily invested in Onyx. Uh, That's good. Just, just to add to that, th this is basically the experience that we have in, in our Azure training. Uh, the object detection and the image classification <clears throat> both currently train in Azure using uh, something in Python, and then it's exported to Onyx, and then it, Model Builder basically wraps that in ML.NET code to to load that Onyx model and um, .NETify it. And uh, even within ML.NET, uh, this has been a more recent effort. Uh, we are investing quite heavily to making sure that all of ML.NET uh, models can be exported to Onyx. Uh, uh, not all of the work is not complete yet. Uh, uh, so the idea is that you could uh, train your model in uh, using ML.NET, and then once you have a model, you could execute that on a CPU or on a GPU. Like ML.NET currently does not support GPU, uh, but if you were to export your model to uh, Onyx, you could execute your model in GPU, and that's a clear advantage. Yeah. So, kind of with that hypothetical situation I gave, you can turn that around too. You can train your model in ML.NET, create an Onyx model, and then hand that off to the data scientist or uh, you know, if they use uh, Flask for their website, they can use that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. A lot of flexibility there. Yeah. And um, kind of shifting gears a little bit. Um, I'm just curious. Do y'all have any like favorite stories of uh, customers using ML.NET in their production environments? Um, I have I have one, um, and it's maybe because I'm Australian. There's an Australian company um, called ScanCam, um, and they're using ML.NET um, to detect uh, people who are trying to steal the gas from um, gas stations. And so they um, take images of uh, cars and license plates, and then they run that, uh, do object detection on the license plates, and then they um, run that um, against a known list of um criminals in Australia um, to, uh, yeah. So that's a, um, I think it's a really fun and useful um, customer story that we have. And Bree has written up um, that uh, story on our uh, customer's website. And I think, is the net result that if it detects the license plate, it ju they just have to go in and pay? Is, is that the prepay or something? Is that the net result? Okay. Yeah, I can uh, I can talk about one of my other favorites um, that was also recently put up as a story is uh, Asgard Systems. They're actually uh, based in Romania and they do uh, forecasting uh, for gr like grocery forecasting uh, at, at grocery stores, and they do it to to eliminate food waste. And it was really cool is the impact that ML done it has have has had. They were able to implement it really really fast in in just its first year. Uh, they achieved greater than 24 million pounds of CO2 emissions in yearly savings. Um, and they actually predict by the end of uh, this year or early next year that they're going to have yearly savings of 240 million pounds of CO2 emissions, um, which is pretty, pretty awesome to see ML.NET have that impact. Um, but yeah, we've seen a lot of uh, different use cases. We have a customer showcase on it, always looking to show off new ones, both internally and externally. Um, so some internal use cases here at Microsoft. Um, um, power, sorry, Windows Defender uses it for anti, uh, what is it, anti threat protection? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, and uh, Power BI uses it for their key influencers. Um, and then I actually recently, I'm, re I'm writing up this story right now, is that the uh, real estate and security group at Microsoft. Um, which does like if you have an issue with something or like something breaks, you put in a report to them and they'll they'll uh, send it out to the right person to come and fix it. They're using ML.NET uh, to detect faults with uh, the AC systems, um, and also they're starting to test. Uh, so that one's already in production, and they're also starting to test image classification. So if something breaks, you can take a picture of it, and then it'll kind of detect, I guess, uh, what's wrong with it, and then it can route it automatically to the correct. Uh, the correct team that it needs to go to so that it can get, uh, it can get fixed even quicker than if it was uh, sorted manually. So a lot of cool use cases, both internally and externally, and we're seeing more and more every day. And I love learning about new stuff. So definitely, if you have a use case, reach out to me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's cool to see and how it's already used in so many places already. Um, let's see. So I know we kind of talked about future plans of ML.NET, but is there any any ways that y'all see where the, the future of ML.NET is, like within the community or anything like that? And I know we had we just had the uh, virtual ML.NET community conference, which uh, did anybody, any of y'all called that any? I watched some of the replays. I wasn't there live. I yeah. watched the videos. Then, I was there, um, but <laughs> I, I guess I can talk to this a little bit. Just that since that um, since that conference, I've seen so much more community engagement, which has been really, really awesome. Um, there was a new subreddit created for ML.NET. I've seen a lot more questions in uh, the VS Marketplace for Model Builder, even though we're no longer an extension, but we used to be. Mm. So already in the past like week, there was like three or four new questions about it. Um, We've also There's, seen an uptick in our bug count. The what? We, we've also seen an uptick in our bug count, which is also a great reflection that, hey, people are using it and they're seeing issues. So yeah, we're always exactly. happy to see those. Exactly. Oh, and uh, Alexander, who is one of the co-organizers of the conference, he's created a new op uh, open source project called mlops.net, which is for mlops for .net, mm -hmm. I think based on MLflow. Uh, I've just started taking a look at it. There's already like three or four contributors. Uh, and I know that John has his videos, Alexander has live streams and starting to see more courses and stuff pop up. So there's been a ton more community engagement. Uh, I'm really excited to see where that goes and what else the community does. Yeah. And I think I've also seen uh, an uptick in questions on Stack Overflow for it as well. Yeah, definitely, totally. I've seen that as well. We're trying to answer them all as quickly as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Eric, I know you've answered a couple already. Yeah, I try every once in a while. I like, <laughs> go out there and see if I can answer one or two. Uh, another case where community engagement kind of upticked, it, not necessarily ML.NET directly, but um, Dan Daniel Castilla, I think I, I don't know how to say his name exactly, but he's been helping us. Um, there is there's a, a an experimental data frame library um, mm -hmm. called Microsoft.data.analysis. And it, you can kind of think of it as like the a pandas data frame only in in .NET, and so you can you know load up your data and then look at it and do do slicing and dicing, and it works even better when you use it in the the .NET interactive environment. So like a Jupyter notebook, or even that team is is you know even more experimental. But VS Code has a notebook experience for Python today, and we're working on getting this the C sharp and F sharp um, and PowerShell, it, the .NET interactive experience in that VS Code. Anyway, when you have um when you're using a data frame in there, you want to be able to you know format or pretty print out the the data when you execute a cell and you print and you print the data frame. And Daniel's been helping us get that integrated automatically. So you just have to reference the data frame library in a notebook and as soon as you start printing out data frames you don't have to have any code to format it it all comes automatically in the nuget package oh, nice. so the community engagement like that we're helping out where we would love to see these features but we just don't have time to do them or don't have the funding to do them right now mm. getting more people involved with with those kinds of things like he he made the formatter way better than we ever did we just kind of showed you the top, you know the first 25 rows and then kind of left it at that and said, oh, there's more rows. And he actually implemented paging so you can page through the rows and mm -hmm. things like that. So I love to see things like that, you know, taking taking things that we made and making them better and helping out, helping us. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, that reminds me of a, one of my computer science professors. You know, you can just take it and make it better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so... I know we mentioned putting in for uh, future requests, putting those in the uh, in the issues in the in the repo. But what are kind of some other ways that people can contribute to ML.NET? Uh, I know we kind of mentioned what Eric just said, kind of just taking stuff, making it better. And uh, but are there any, any other ways that people can contribute? Yeah, there are a few other ways. Um, so you can contribute to the docs. Um, so um, the um, Docs are also open source. So uh, if you go to uh, github.net um, um, 
.NET docs machine learning. Um, you'll find the docs in there. And I mean, even just, you know, fixing a typo or, you know, improving some um, way, you know, something is described or, you know, people can let, make people learn that easier is a great, um, you know, we really appreciate those efforts. And it also, if you're, you know, starting out in open source, it's a great way to get going. Um, we also have um, a samples repository. Um, so if you actually develop a sample using ML.NET, um, you can um, contribute to that samples repository and um, we will, um, you know, check it and um, validate it and uh, you can have that, you know, your sample in our uh, samples repository. Um, and then, of course, we've got the core um, repo. Um, we were talking about the subreddit and the Stack Overflow questions. You can actually, if you you know have that sort of expertise, you can actually go in and answer those questions um, yourself. We love that when like community, our community helps each other um, to answer questions. Uh, so yeah, there's there's lots and lots of ways that um, you can engage and contribute to ML.net. I also want to add. Uh, I don't know what Bree said earlier, which is uh, tell us our stories. Tell us what you've been doing with ML.net. Uh, We'd love to learn uh, what sort of cool things you've built with ML.NET, and that sort of uh, motivates us in the right direction uh, because it'll let us know what the gaps are, where you are feeling, where you have executed things well, where you struggled with, and that lets us uh, identify spots to work on. So, yeah, and and that that is actually one of the challenges of working with open source software is that sometimes we don't know um, what our customers are doing um, because we're not you know like handing over a, a product every time, so. Um, we'd love to hear back from, um, you know, customers about their success stories or their challenges. Totally. Yeah. I'll just to add to that too, is I think that um, at least internally, we, we feel like developers kind of have a high pain tolerance and, but we actually want to hear all of the pains you're going through. So like reach out to us, even if you like got through a problem, you found a way to solve it yourself. You um, like, let us know that way, like the next, you know, people that come to use our tooling, um, or our APIs or something like that don't have to like go through those same struggles. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a problem that you haven't solved. Like reach out to us if you're if you you know there's something that that we need to to polish. Um, let us know. Yeah, there's a great uh, term internally uh, called paper cuts. Uh, issues that don't bother you that much. It's just a minor paper cut, and you somehow get through it but enough of these paper cuts accumulate and it sort of bothers you. Uh, so we would love to hear even of those kinds of issues and those kinds of stories. Uh, but hey, this thing is good, but this is just slightly annoying. Uh, if you have the, the uh, ability to fix those directly, we would welcome that totally. But even if not, we would love to hear what you uh, actually went through. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of ways somebody can contribute there. Cool. Uh, so. Last couple of things, I, I did a small poll on Twitter of what uh, some people may want to ask. Um, there was one question, uh, you know, future direction of ML.net. I think we kind of hit that already, but they also mentioned uh, CNTK. Uh, can anybody mention that? I think right now our focus is on uh, ML.net. Uh, CNTK brings uh, basically uh, neural network capabilities, and right now there are lots of uh, competing frameworks. And we are trying to uh, evaluate which one uh, works best, uh, which one is uh, well suited for .NET developers. But uh, I would say that is not uh, uh, the so so where ML.NET is headed is uh, less about the internal low-level uh, frameworks and more about giving developers uh, scenario-focused APIs and scenario-focused capabilities. Uh, because our, our whole goal is to make it easy to get into machine learning and AI uh, and allow developers to build the solutions that uh, for their problems very easily. So whether it's CNTK or TensorFlow or PyTorch, that's not uh, as important a question as are we bringing new uh, scenario uh, cap capabilities like object detection or better text processing and text classification or other natural language generation capabilities. And those are the things that uh, we are uh, actively focused on, and how do we uh, light those scenarios up for our uh, developers? And that's where our focus is. Yeah, it's good to see that it's more kind of bridges the barrier to for developers to get get started there. Uh, another question was, uh, can I build a mobile app using ML.NET? 
today you can you, you can at least um, have your have your machine learning model hosted on your server and make a make a service request you, you know to a, to a service that has ml.net model in there like one one question we get asked or i get asked every every once in a while is well i want to run the the model on the mobile app and um one one thing to be aware of when you do anything like that right is that your your model if it contains secrets of any sort or you want to keep it pub, you know private putting it in into a mobile app or onto a client somehow like people are going to be able to get to your model then so it's just something you just need to be aware of but um, today, when say if you want to make a, a Xamarin application and target say iOS, which is going to be running on an ARM processor, to, today um, it, it's not possible to to even in, you know make an inference on in machine learning on that on that Xamarin application. But when when Xamarin gets ported to um, .NET five and and uses the .NET five O um, TFM in in ML.NET, the the thing that that causes the problem of why you can't run it in Xamarin is because the low level math that happens is all written in C plus plus, and we never and we never we don't build that for ARM today. So either we would need to build that that co that core piece on, on ARM, or in in .NET 3.0 .NET Core 3.0. We added APIs to allow you to do what's called SIMD processing or like hardware acceleration, um, all in C sharp, right? So you can do say, you know, four multiplications of of a float of a floating point, all at, in one machine instruction, right? That that was the low level math code that was written in C plus plus. We rewrote that in C sharp, and then to take advantage of these new APIs, but those APIs don't exist in Xamarin. Until until Xamarin gets ported onto .NET 5, and so in the future you will be able to run your uh, some of the machine learning of the ML.NET models that you made on a mobile app. That being said, as well, if you can export it to Onyx, you can you can um, do Onyx in yeah. inference in on that mobile app as well. Mm. So I mean, there's there's options, and there'll be more options in the future. It's kind of the my answer. Yeah. So, at the very least, you can use an API to make the call. Right. Which would be my, well, depending on exactly what you need to do, but that's probably the way I would start. Mm -hmm. Is I'd have a service where you send the data to the service, it does the processing and sends back the the prediction. Okay. And. Another question: Can we expect GPU supports with ML.NET? Uh, <clears throat> our GPU support, uh, I think, is through the Onyx route uh, for inferencing. Uh, we uh, haven't uh, thought explicitly about uh, GPU support for training as yet. Uh, but if there is a scenario that they care about, uh, we would love to hear more and understand what is their motivation for uh, uh, GPU training on uh, C-sharp and ML.NET. We okay. do have GPU support in ML.NET for, um, for image classification. You can, you can yep. add in, right. um, yep. it's kind of built on top of TensorFlow.NET. So if you, if you change your dependency from the, the CPU version that um, over to the GPU version and set up your machine to have CUDA and CUDNN, um, you can do GPU training there. Um, and we're from a tooling side, we're going to be um, releasing a sort of preview feature where where you'll be able to install not just ML.NET Model Builder, but ML.NET Model Builder GPU something. I don't know. I don't know if we've officially come up with a name yet. Um, but somehow we'll, we'll we'll show you we'll like give you a way to install this um, other extension that basically adds GPU training on top of Model Builder. So if it's installed, Model Builder will try GPU training. Um, there is sort of a weird thing. Um, you'll see this in our documentation once we release it, but like it, it's tough to actually get through the process of installing um, CUDA and CUDNN correctly. Uh, it's and then 
even those installers actually have bugs where it'll try and install drivers that don't have it, it doesn't matter uh, but we'll try to we'll try to document it away we'll try to um, help you get through it and then we're also working on um, trying to to make that experience better by either using a new version of, of tensorflow or, or looking at the other options that are out there um, so it's on our mind especially for uh, like image classification and object detection scenarios where like having that GPU support will save you you know 90 percent of your time um, but we don't have the full story yet but a preview feature coming soon okay um, I guess last question is uh, right now there's a load and score tensorflow model uh, what about uh, uh, load and score top uh, pytorch models that's, uh, that's a great question uh, I, I think we haven't uh, thought about it explicitly uh, but we'll definitely take it into consideration but you can um, export a pytorch model to onyx so you have the the full functionality of a pytorch model that and then then we can score that in an log.net yeah. Um, so you can you can do the thing you want to do. You just need to um, there's one extra step that you need to go through to export that to Onyx. Well, that's kind of all that I have. Uh, is there anything anybody wants to add? So uh, one thing I do want to add is uh, I think what you're doing is also great for the community. Uh, so you are asking how we can help the community. So thank you for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate this, uh, and uh, hope we can talk more in the future. Yeah, look forward to it. Totally. I think one of one thing to help is is uh, is growing the community. So like if you if you use ML.net, you like ML.net, tell people about it. Uh, let's let's start building a bigger community and then they'll ask us for more things and we'll keep building more more things. Like, subscribe, all that. <laughs> <laughs> Wipe up the subscribes, that how it works. Um, I, it's like click I the link below. Yeah, exactly. Right, right here. You're gonna use this, right, John? Um, <laughs> the only thing I wanted to say is I'm really excited to see how people are using ML.NET and what you all want to see next. And also, stay tuned for an ML.NET hackathon. <laughs> That's all. All right. Well, again, thank you all for uh, joining me and answering my questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Great. you, Thanks, John. John.